So in Matthew 23, starting in verse 10, it says, Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. <clears throat> whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbleth himself will be exalted. So when we read this text, what are we reading about? What traits should we show in Matthew 23? Humility. Humility. And when we think of humility, do we see a lot of, we can see it around us, but when we go to social media, when we go to, if we open up Sports Center or just anything like that, do we see a lot of humility? Unfortunately, from what I've seen, that's not always the case, right? We see a lot of people who are humble, and in this text, it, it's, it's a command, right? You know, whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. We see the importance of being humble. You know, not showing pride in yourself. So we see that humility, and it talks about Jesus. And that's why I want to go back to verse 10 through 11. Because didn't Jesus show humility? What did he do to the disciples? Or I should say, what did he do for the disciples? Wash their feet. This is the Son of God, right? <clears throat> and He offered services to the disciples after they were out traveling all day. Right? And we see <clears throat> that even the Son of God who ascended from heaven and came to earth still was serving people on earth. And we see that with Jesus. And aren't we supposed to be like Jesus? <clears throat> He knew Judas was going to be trained and he washed his feet too. But he told us to love your enemies and pray for those who spitefully use you. So, there again, if we're not careful, the flesh of us wants to get even, you know, pay our enemies and stuff. But Jesus said, no, you love your enemies. And, you know, that's just very fundamental to a New Testament Christian. But in Proverbs, it said, don't rejoice when your enemy falls, lest the Lord will take away his wrath from that person. So, got forth this bar. And that's not what comes in the actual the flesh says no, you retaliate. You return to evil for evil. You, you know, you possess this animosity in your heart towards those who have done evil for you. And the spirit says no, that's not the word. So it, it addresses us at the very core of our being. Right, do you think that was easy for him to do? You know, when you when you know somebody's about to betray you, when you know that one of the people you should trust the most is about to betray you, and yet you're still serving him. Do you think that was easy for Jesus to do? Right? It's not, as we would say, a walk in the park. He, he still felt betrayed in that moment, and yet he still did that because he was humble. Right? He didn't think, you know, he was evil unto me. I'm too good to, I'm too good to serve him. I'm the son of God. Who does he think he is? Right? That's not what happens here. He knew exactly what was going to happen in the future, yet he still served Judas as well, right? He didn't say, okay, 11 of you, I'm going to serve you. Judas, stay over there, right? He didn't say that. He still offered services to everybody because of how humble he is. And sometimes that's a little tough for us. <clears throat> when somebody does something evil to you, what, what is your, you know, you, it's basically a plan of attack, right? I, I'm going to get them. Right? But we can't think in that way. We're turning evil for evil and thinking we are too good. Right? If they're going to act like this to us, we're, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, be good unto them, but I think I saw a hand. Yeah, do you think about it? You know, if, if I'm not careful, I can see myself that loving your enemies to this point is something that's exclusive to Jesus because he's God in the flesh. But then I think about Paul's size will be the broad and put in prison. Acts chapter 16, and then after the earthquake, we're actually over the, the, the jail, or the, the Philippian jail was going to kill himself. Well, Paul had that love for the very man, probably put his feet in his thoughts. Don't know if he had any new memory of the meeting of it, but what he do? He said, hey, don't do yourself anymore. Let a whole family with Christ, the Philippian jail. You know what I mean? So he had that love for any of those people that took part in this treatment. So it's not just Jesus that has to have that. And there's an example of somebody you know, that wasn't Jesus. Apostle Paul, but obviously loved the soul of that jailer that had part of his incarceration, that came to Christ. 
Right, and <clears throat> when it comes to Jesus again, and you think of when he was on earth trying to save people, you know, and people rejected the word. And so you have to think he felt a sense of betrayal to his father in this in those periods because of people rejecting his father, right? The people were rejecting God in front of Jesus. And I think of I'm very protective. I have two sisters and I have a mother. And you best believe if you mess with one of the one of our sisters or our mother, you're gonna get both my brother and I are gonna be the first ones there. I'm protective of my family. You gotta think of Jesus in that moment, whose whose father was basically being rejected. You know, how do you think that made him feel? Right? It's not just him. You know, he had to go through that with people rejecting his own family. And so let me ask you. As people in this congregation right now, if somebody rejects your family, if somebody does something against your family, what are you going to do? <coughs> right? What's your, what's your mindset there? Because I've had instances where some people have done that with my family in the past. I've not reacted the way that I wanted to react. Right? Because when that comes, you're in basically that fight or flight mode. Right? When something comes against the people you love, it is hard to forgive. Very hard. But Jesus, not only forgiving those who did wrong to him, but he forgave those and died for those who were also doing wrong to his father. And that's, and you said the example of Paul, you know, if we take away Jesus for a second and think, well, you know, the Son of God can do it, but it's impossible for us, then we look at the example of Paul being in prison, and yet he still was trying to save those who wronged him. We think of Stephen, right? And that scene that Stephen was getting stoned, he still said, Father, forgive them. I'll try to be quiet after this one, but here's the thing. The political season going on, and Marsh and I do a lot of things together, and I get drawn into this political things and people that do things and promote things that go fly right in the face of God's Word, and I get mad. I mean, if I, and I, I do that, and I... It infuriates me, but see, I end up sinning if I'm not careful because I'm supposed to pray for these people. But the flesh of me says, hey, <laughs> and, I, and I fail now, so you guys can pray for me in that area, but I mean, I get drawn into this because it makes you so upset, or does me anyways, and, and they're promoting the abortion of babies and all these things. And i got to say, wait a minute now, the Word said pray for our leaders, but if I'm not careful, I get infuriated over this. So, I mean, that's just something I struck with. Maybe that helps somebody else. Yeah, and I, the same thing happened to me yesterday. So, my family and I went to Pittsburgh. We had a dinner. And uh, after we were done, I took Rosanna to go uh, to this putt putt place that was really nice. And, you know, I've always been taught manners my whole life for my family. So, we were going in there, and this, this woman was, you know, she was like, you know, here's what you do. You know, here's how you keep score. This is going to show up. And I said, thank you, ma'am. And she said, it's sir. Right? She had that, like, like attack move, that kind of thing to me. And I was like, and I told Rosanna that. I was like, how am I supposed to know? I was just showing good manners. And, and she tells me, she says, listen, I know it's tough sometimes, but just, just pray for her. Right? Even though she went to that, you know, she hate to say this on camera, but she doesn't know any better, right? Just pray for her. You know, like, <clears throat> even if she's going to be doing that to you and trying to offer up that mean response to you, you know, just just pray that maybe one day she sees what God's Word brings, and maybe one day we can get past that. And, and right in that moment, I was, you know, I was a little bit frustrated. Because I was just showing manners. I was just doing what my parents taught me to do. And yet, it was still wrong in the moment. And so my immediate reaction was, I'm never showing manners again. Next time, I'll just, you know, keep walking. You know, sorry, sir. You know, you know that's just the response that I was just willing to offer in the moment. Instead of thinking about the bigger picture. And that's... What I appreciated in that moment was Rosanna helped me see that. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I should have reacted differently. 
But if you suffer there a little bit mentally, it may have been uh, just a little bit, you know, because you were rebuked for showing men. Well, Jesus said, when you suffer for doing good, Peter also wrote about that. You're going to be blessed for that very act, and you think, well, that was kind of annoying then. Very little when compared to the whole scheme of things. But in reality, God's going to bless you because you suffer for doing what you know, you've been taught, which was, I mean, if you look at it that way, it may kind of take a little bit of the sting off of it. Yeah, that's. That's what I was, I was always, you know, I told her, I, I said, you know, I never thought that I would, you know, somebody would get mad at me for showing manners, but, you know, that's just <clears throat> the world we live in, and sometimes we have to adapt to it, because not, not adapt to it like support it, but just adapt to it knowing that we see that out there and that we still need to go to God's Word and try to be patient when those moments come. So... We talked about that in Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. And this is just another text talking about Jesus. And it says, It shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's kind of, that's just another text demonstrating on what Christ did for us, right? When I had that moment yesterday, Jesus saw people like that his whole life and yet still died for them. Right? So he was here not to be served, but to serve. He wasn't here saying, everybody, I'm the, son of, I'm the son of God, bow down to me. Right? He said, I'm here to serve you, and I'm here to teach you about the word of God. And so that's what we always say, you know, when people are always telling you to be like Christ, that's just one of the character traits that we should show, that he showed is that humility. He was able and willing to serve others, even as the son of God. You know, that's, a lot of times, if I see on, if I see on a sports center, you know, I, I've seen multiple times, you know, LeBron James say, "Well, I'm, I'm LeBron, right? I'm, I'm the greatest of all time. I don't, I don't do that. I'm, I'm too good for that." Sorry to the LeBron fans in here, but you know, I've seen it multiple times. But th that's just. A guy that was born and raised here on earth, this is a guy who came straight from heaven and still served others. Right? That's just an example that we can see just to make sure that even if we don't agree with somebody, we're not going to be too good for anybody. Right? We're all made in the image and the sight of the Lord. We're all children of God. All right. Last text in lesson four. Let's get a proverb. Proverbs chapter three and five and six. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Actually, let's go to verse 1. So let's go to Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. Because it gives a little bit of a background to this next question that we have. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So when we look at the text, and we look at uh, A, it says, when we trust God, who directs our steps? What is, what does that talk about? You know, when we trust him, who directs our steps? He does. He does. We see that mainly in verse 5 and 6 when it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean 
on your own understanding. So what does that say about us? something happens to you and it might be something you don't agree with, what's our first response to that basically? Mine is not proud to say this, but mine is to sit there and feel sorry for myself. Right? Sometimes we get into that mode of leaning on our own understanding of things, right? My understanding was this, and now I'm going to be miserable because of it. Instead, what I should have done is pray to God and trust what He says. <clears throat> we can't lean on our own understanding. That's the first call, right? Alright. Thank you. So, <clears throat> and it says, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your path. So I want to ask you a question. And also to young people as well. Is there ever a time that you messed up? And instead of asking your parents to help you with it, you just went your own way and found out <coughs> that that was not the best way for you to go. And maybe sometimes you get unasked, unwanted advice from your parents and they turned out to be right. You know, that's the same thing here. It says, trust in your Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Right? What he's saying is sometimes you don't even have to take things in your own hands. Just trust in what God has placed for you. Read his word, pray for him, talk to him. And you might get your answer. We can convince ourselves sometimes it will work out. Talk about our own obedience to all the commandments of God. But we mentioned that a week or so ago about Abraham. We didn't know exactly the Hebrew writer, but he says that Abraham had faith in God to raise Isaac up again. But, I mean, that's what it says about his faith. Okay? And he didn't know how it was going to work out. He knew that Isaac was going to be the father of many descendants or whatever. But Abraham went ahead and done it. And sometimes, in a lot of lesser matters, you know, we're not asked to kill somebody. We might know what God's word says, but then we'll say, well, the only way this will work out is if I get outside of God's word and go ahead and do it this way. I'm pretty certain it'll work out this way. But if I'm going to do the word of God, like seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, his life is all these things to be added to it. Well, I may think I'm going to go pursue this or whatever, where I'm not going to have a necessity of life, where in reality, if I demonstrate, not just say, but, but I demonstrate that I trust God, then I'll, I'll stay within the confines of his word. Instead of justifying disobedience, because I think my understanding is better than the real word of God. All right, he has all the knowledge, and I and I think of the same example. A few about a month ago, my dad and I did this huge project outside of our house, and we built our deck. And at times, I was questioning. I was like, you know, how are we? You know, when we do certain things with this project, you know, this isn't looking right right now. And I would tell my dad that, and he said, just, just trust me, it'll all work out. And I said, all right, you know, thinking 25-year-old me knew a lot more than my dad did in all of his years. I'm not going to say his age on here, but, right? He, he, I was like, there's no way he knows more than me. But then I trusted in what he told me, and once we were done, it, this deck looked beautiful. And no thanks to me, right? This was all he told me from day one. He said, trust what I have. I know what I'm doing. We're going to get it done, and it's going to look beautiful. And so I finally gave in, trusted him, because, you know, us as young people, we know everything. Right? We know, we know everything. We know more than our parents. 
So when I trusted him, he's the one who's been doing this since he was a kid, right? My grandpa taught him how to woodwork. And so he, and let's just say he's over 50, may or may not be, he is, but you know, in his over 50 years of living life, a lot of that time he was doing this stuff. And so I was like, you know, he knows this, I'll trust in it, and it looks nice. Same thing with God. When it comes to our everyday lives, right? What does Genesis 1-1 say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was there this whole time. God has seen it all. God has all the knowledge. God knows exactly what has happened before us and what's going to happen after us. Trust in Him. Right? This is the guy who created everything that we see. He has shown us that He has the knowledge. He has wisdom. Right? Solomon's known as the wisest man in Scripture. Where do you think he got that from? He got it from God because he asked God. So we know that he's wise. You know, he's seen it before. He's seen everything that's happened. So why don't we trust in him when it comes to the steps of our life? You know, that's just the same thing with my dad and I working on our project together. You know, I should have trusted in him from the start. He knew what he was doing. He's been doing it for over 40 years. And yet I thought I knew more than him. And I'm telling you, if we did it the way I would have said, we probably would still be building it. We probably would have started over at least five times. But that's the same thing with us as Christians, right? If we trust what we have to bring to the table more than God, a lot of times we're probably going to have to start over and backtrack. I've had to do that multiple times. I've had to backtrack because I thought I knew what was best for me in that moment instead of trusting the Father. Didn't even get done with lesson four. All right, we'll start with lesson five on Wednesday, Lord willing, but I appreciate you all for your comments and, and your participation in class and look forward to another study today.